morgue, where victims of every kind of violence are brought until the families collect the bodies for burial. A Shia militia called the Mahdi Army control everything. Their gunmen stood behind the local cameraman the whole time. All the men he saw here were Shia. The only Sunnis were women. If their men come, they're threatened and sometimes kidnapped and killed. And the morgue isn't the only place in Baghdad ruled by the Mahdi army. Our Iraqi colleague has come to see a Sunni group called the Association of Muslim Scholars. People bring their problems here because they don't trust the police. And the most common problem is a Shia militia group called the Mahdi Army. Hamid is a Sunni living in a mixed area, but the Mahdi Army have given his family two days to leave their home or they'll be killed. It's a relative. There's a problem with the driver they've hired to go and collect the furniture from their house. The families found a Shia driver thinking he'll be allowed through, but the Mahdi army have threatened him. They harm people, burn houses and threaten the citizens. But they always get through the checkpoints under the nose of the army and the police. That's why I say these violations take place with the blessing and the participation of the government. That's why we place responsibility on the government. Another call, same problem. A woman asks the sheikh if he'll notify the Americans that her family has been attacked by the Mahdi army. The Sheikh gave us dozens of videos. His association is logging all the crimes. Here, 36 Sunnis had been rounded up by the police for no obvious reason apart from living in a mixed neighborhood. They were found with their faces disfigured by acid. Killing doesn't seem to be enough. The death squads also want to terrify those left behind. He was among 14 farmers arrested, all Sunni, as a reprisal for a car bomb which had killed many Shia. This continuous cycle of sectarian violence now affects almost everyone you meet. We've just heard from one of the human rights uh, people that we've been working with in Jordan. His family are still here in Baghdad. And this morning, his brother was kidnapped. He was actually pulled off a bus by the Mahdi army. And they've told the family that they've taken him for interrogation. And that's really chilling, because usually in these cases, the next thing the family hears is that a body's been found on the street. 
And you know, these kind of stories are now happening here almost every single day. For three agonizing days, the family negotiate with the kidnappers and eventually pay $15,000 ransom. He's released. We can't go and see him because militiamen are keeping watch on the house, so the family email us these pictures. He's described how he was handcuffed and then hung from a door frame so that his shoulders were almost ripped out of their sockets. And he says the handcuffs cut right through to the bones. And he can't walk because he was beaten so badly on the legs with an iron bar. It's really a mark of how desperate things are in this town, that a man who's been dreadfully tortured but not actually killed feels like a good news story. The random violence consuming this city doesn't surprise Douglas Brand. The former Deputy Chief Constable of South Yorkshire was seconded to Baghdad after the invasion and given the epic task of rebuilding a professional police force. But the Americans didn't mind the number of militiamen signing up. Whole groups were enlisted into the police and they wanted to have the graduation parades, to have them in new uniforms, put them out and nobody was too interested about what happened when they actually went out there. Did you voice those concerns? I would say probably um, ten times a day. To um, whom? At what levels? To whoever would listen, usually two star generals and above. I did have the opportunity on one occasion to raise it with Donald Rumsfeld when he visited, but I sensed that um, the subtleties were not understood and that so if there were consequences down the road well that was part of building a democracy and that's something that the Iraqis would have to handle themselves. From the beginning there's been a willingness to turn a blind eye to how the police are operating. Two years ago when the first commando units were being set up Kevin Maris was a sniper based inside the Ministry of the Interior. The MOI was an 11-story building, uh, kind of rectangular in shape. Uh, we had uh, observation posts on uh, the east and west side uh, in the upper floors. He took pictures through his telescopic sight as the police brought prisoners into a ministry compound below him. They were forced onto their knees. Uh, their shirts were stripped off their back. At first they were just beaten with rubber hoses. Uh, there were sometimes as many as two or three individuals that were beating the one bound and blindfolded prisoner. As time progressed and they worked their way through people, uh, the beatings got more severe. At one point, a, a metal bar was used. They were tying their feet and elevating them and then beating the soles of their feet. Kevin alerted his unit, and troops arrived to stop the torture. But after an hour, U.S. headquarters ordered them to withdraw. Most prisoners were later transferred to proper jails, but not before they were beaten again. When we returned to the patrol base, uh, there was a general order, uh, a generalized order, not to speak uh, of the incident. Uh, 